Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, Remembering God, Pastor Joanne Arizaga teaches that God left his fingerprints over all of creation so that we will remember him. The message, as Pastor Margaret said today, is remembering God. And um, I want to go ahead and get through some quick basics in the scripture to make sure the foundation's there. So, you know, you don't have to take my word for it that this is true, but that I can show you scripturally um, what I believe was in the heart of the Father when he was planning this all out, his beautiful family that he wanted to create and share his life with or his kingdom with. So in Genesis 1.1, I'm sure you've seen this multiple times. It says that God created the heavens and the earth. And uh, when we're looking at this construction in Hebrew, the word created is bara. It means from nothing. It means to literally take something from nothing or to have nothing and turn it into something. But when we also look further in Genesis, Genesis 2, 7, we see that the word that says that the Lord formed the man. It says the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Now I want to show you a couple more scriptures because I want you to see something here. Genesis 2:19 says the same uses the same verb. It says now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them and whatever he called them, every living creature that was their name. See, again, we've got the word formed. And I'm going to look at it one more time in Jeremiah 1, 5. And it says that before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Now, see, this word formed is different than bara. This is yisad. This is that he fashioned. Maybe some of the translations you've read for this scripture is he fashioned. It's an artist. He took nothing, made something in creating, but then like an artist, he began to form and fashion everything that he made. And an artist leaves their brush strokes or a reflection of who they are in all their work. And so when you, when you start to get the idea that he could have said, he created birds, he created men, he created you, but he didn't. He took the time to say, I created from nothing, but I fashioned you. I formed you. I formed everything. God is the original and most gifted, skillful artist in all of creation. And so then we look at Romans 1, verses 19 and 20, and an interesting thing begins to develop. And when I saw this, the first time I saw this, it made me cry. It says, having been clearly perceived, oh, sorry, we'll go back, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and his divine nature. And I just want you to look at that again. His invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that people are without excuse. What he did was he left us a map. He took everything about himself that was invisible and he put it in everything he created so we could find him. He knew we were going to lose our way. He knew we were going to live on different continents. He knew that Pangea was going to separate and there were going to be countries that were, and, and, uh, that were isolated. And he put a map so that every single person on the earth, every single being on the planet, everything that he created could find their way back to him. You know, I think about um, 
You know, Luke 19 says that if we don't praise him, even rocks will cry out. I mean, he, it says in Job that he hung the sun and the moon and the stars. There is nothing in creation. I mean, rocks remember him, people. This is a comprehensive map that we are talking about. He took the time to embed himself, a reflection of himself everywhere, so that if you wanted him, you could find your way to him. But not only that, but as a protection, because there were going to be people he knew that were going to come and lie about him. The fallen spiritual creation lies about him. They say he's angry, can't be trusted, better not put your hope in him. Or he has partiality, he shows favoritism. There's all kinds of messages that we're taught in multiple religions that try to tell us what God is like. And to protect us, to make it possible for us to find him, he put a map so that we wouldn't be deceived by the messages that are incongruent or not reflective of who he is as God. You know, when you look at the creation, it says, well, Romans 1, 19 and 20 says, he, everything that he made, which means if you've seen sunsets, if you've seen the Grand Canyon, if you've seen the ocean when it's clear, if you've seen it when it's stormy, if you've seen skies and clouds that move, anything, if you've seen animals, if you've seen people in beauty and grace, um, anything that you've seen, there is a reflection of the depth and the complexity and the variances of who he is. Religion often puts God in a box. And he wanted to make sure, what color is God? How can you, what color is a sunset? Depends on where you are. If you're in South Africa on Table Mountain, let me tell you, you've never seen a sunset. I'd never seen a sunset like that. I really thought at this moment, you could take me to heaven and I'd be square. I mean, like it was unreal. But I've also seen sunsets in my backyard and I've seen them in, in Key West and, you know, when you look at this, what color is a sunset? It's whatever color it wants to be. It's whatever color light makes it. And so when you realize that this is what God wanted to say, religion in a negative sense is about conformity, but faith and the image of who God is and how it's reflected everywhere is about depth and beauty and, and about a scope. You know, this is the thing that I know about God. He's everything I hoped he would be, but so much more. And, um, and so I was grateful for this map because um, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And when you don't grow up, um, and it's a blessing to grow up with a heritage. My kids grew up with a heritage of faith. They were taught the word. My grandchildren have the same. But my husband and I didn't have that. So we came to the Lord wanting to know what he was like. And we went to a couple different churches. We went through a few different religions. The first time I heard the gospel, I was 16 years old. I went home and told my mom, hey, I heard this today um, at this church, and I think I'm going to accept Jesus. And she said, no, ma'am. She said, you go back and tell that pastor, you don't have permission to be a Christian. We're not Christians. And um, I remember thinking, well, I'm not I'm not sure it works that way, Mom. I'm pretty sure you don't get to make this decision for me. But it was years later when I actually heard the gospel as an adult with my husband, and, and we, something in us said, yes, this is the truth. This is the way to go. And so when you think about, well, why does he want, besides wanting you to find your way to him, he also wanted you to be able to know what he was really like. So what is God like? Psalm 105 says that the Lord is good and his mercy endures, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Over 65 times in the scripture, the declaration is made about the character of the Lord, that he's good, that he's merciful, that he's slow to anger to all people through all generations, to the end of time. This is what he's like. But maybe that's not the gospel you heard. Maybe you heard God is mad. 
Maybe you heard he's mad at sinners and you better not step out of line and you better get this Christianity thing right because you don't want to fall into the hands of an angry God. But this is the problem with that. The Bible says that the Lord, that God poured out his wrath on Jesus. So if he's angry, something's wrong. Now, he might still be angry about sin and iniquity, but saints, he is not angry at you. He is not angry at all. He poured out his wrath. That part of, of us and God being angry, it's finished. And so, you know, when you look at Psalm 107, it says the Lord is good. And this used to be a declaration of the church and the people would say all the time. And then the people would say all the time. And then the people would say the Lord is good. Why do they say that? Because Psalm 107 says, say it. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. You know, I had a friend once that said that. She said, why do you think the Lord wants us to say so? <laughs> I said, I think that's a literal interpretation. I think he wants us to say so, that the Lord is good. See, people need to hear about the goodness of God, about the fact that he loves us so much, that he loves his creation so much, that he put a map together so that we could find him, no matter what the condition of our life. If you continue reading in Romans 1 on your own, read verses 21 through 32. You'll find out that it's sin that caused us to not be able to read the map anymore. And the further we moved away from God, even though we have the map, we lost the ability to read it. And the map is still there though, and that's the good news. And any time anyone decides that they want to turn towards the Lord, that they want to activate their map reading skills, they're there for you to find him. Um, and so in the good news, we see that this good God sends good news. Luke 2, verses 8 through 11, the angels came and they gave the shepherds a message. And they said, we are bringing you good news. It says, if you go on to the next verse, it says that the good news is coming to all men. We're bringing you good tidings of great joy that are going to all men. And it's the good news. So now we see in Luke 11, it says, fear not and behold, for I bring you good news of great joy. That's the good news. You know, Jesus in Luke 4, he reads over himself when he's in the temple from Isaiah 61. And he says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me today to speak good news. You know, when I got saved, I thought maybe the good news was um, a list of rules that I had to follow and my tithe envelopes and my assignment for the nursery schedule. <laughs> I thought that was kind of the good news. Like if you want to go to heaven, this is how it works. You do right. Don't do anything wrong that's on the list. Pay your tithes and offerings and show up every time you're scheduled to work. But see, the good news is that the sin problem has been resolved. You know, I, when, when you consider that in Eden, we lost a connection to God through sin. You know, he said, if the day you eat from this tree, you'll surely die. Well, that wasn't a, a natural death. It was a spiritual death because you know what God considers dead? When you're not connected to him. He says, you're dead. You may be walking around alive, but if you're not connected to him, if you're not in relationship with him, you're dead by his definition, not physical death. But see, what he did is he solved that problem. And you know what I love? Revelation says that he not only solved the problem, but it's not like we created the problem and he threw his hands up like, oh my gosh, Adam and Eve have sinned and people have been disobedient. Revelation says that Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. He provided for that sin problem before the problem even existed, because that's the kind of God that he is. He provides for need before it exists. And that's what's the good news. The good news is redemption, restoration, reconciliation, that we can turn back to God and that we can have that relationship with the creator, with the artist that he intended for us to have, because it's the only way to have John 10, 10. You know, a lot of people think Jesus came to give us eternal life. Surely he did. But John 10, 10 says, I came to give you life abundant. 
That in the Greek is fulfilled, a fulfilled life on this side. See, that's the way this is supposed to work. In the beginning, I just thought, keep the rules, pay the tithes, do my job, and hang out and wait until Jesus comes back, right? And then, like, all the fun starts. But as I begin to remember him and to learn him as he really is, not as I was being told sometimes how he was, I began to realize, man, he had this all hooked up from the get-go, that John 10.10 10 is a promise that in this life and the life to come, Calvary, the benefits of Calvary is like billions of dollars that are available to us, and yet often most of us have about 10 bucks of salvation in our back pocket, and that's it. And yet we're heirs to an abundance in remembering him, who he is, how he wants to walk things out with us. And so there's no partiality in God. Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29, says that in Christ we have, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, if you'll keep going to the next scripture, please. And there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring or his seed, heirs according to the promise. See, the sin problem being resolved, Jesus becomes the great equalizer eliminates distinction, eliminates partiality. I've had occasion to come across some people in the time that I've been saved that um, had taken the understanding that Jewish people are chosen, the word says, and turned it into some type of favoritism as if like, well, these are God's favorite people, but thank, you know, you just get to be on the train to be grateful. You know, now not everybody teaches that, but some people surely have. But what they don't understand is Jewish people, God is not partial to Jewish people. There's no favoritism with God at all. We just read that. There's neither Jew nor Greek, nor male nor female. In Jesus, we find that what chosen means is to do a job. See, when he was putting the map everywhere, All throughout the creation, he also picked a race of people and said, I want you to show everyone else what I'm like, how to worship me, what my character is. The Jewish people were chosen to do a job to reveal what the loving artist, our heavenly father, the father of all of us, and that they were there to reveal that to us. I started this by saying we are talking about remembering God. And I want to say this, that um, when we look at the word remember in Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5, which is what we started with, where uh, God was talking to the prophet Jeremiah, it says that before, now the word of the Lord came to me, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. That word knew you is yada in Hebrew. It means that he knew you, he didn't know about you. He didn't know intimately. It meant that he knew you relationally. You knew him, he knew you first before anything else ever happened to you in this life. And that is such a powerful truth to understand because with the help of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to zakar. It is the one imperative statement that the Father used the most with all of the people throughout the Bible. Remember, don't forget. Remember, don't forget. We have the opportunity to remember him in ways that change our life, that heal us, regardless of the trauma, neglect, abuse, unfairness that we've experienced on a cultural level, on a personal level, on a familial level. He is here. He put the map. And I want to invite you today uh, to join me next week for part two of this as I break that down a little bit more. But I want to invite you today to pray with me. If you would like to remember, 
If you want to remember, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to help to us today. John says that, that the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, when, I, when the Holy Spirit comes, when the Father sends him, he is going to help you remember everything that I said, John 14, 26. I believe the Holy Spirit is present today to help um, listeners abroad, the people in this room, to remember who he is, what he's like, truly, honestly, authentically. So I invite you to pray. Holy Spirit, would you activate the map and our map reading skills today for all those in the sound of my voice that they might truly and honestly remember you no matter where they grew up, no matter what they were taught, no matter what they weren't taught, no matter what they experienced in this life or didn't experience. I bless you to remember your heavenly father and what he's really like. If you're listening today and you've never asked Jesus to be your savior, it's really simple. As you've heard, God is good. He formed you. He loves you. He has, he wants to live with you. He doesn't want to be distant and far away or mean and angry. He wants you. And so I invite you, it's really as simple. You know, when I prayed to accept Jesus, it was like this. God, if you're real, I don't know if you are, but if you are, would you come show yourself to me? He honored that prayer. <laughs> he really did. So do that with me right now. Father God, forgive me for thinking you were somehow harsh or distant or unloving. And I come now and just repent of my sins. In many ways, I've gone wrong. And I accept that Jesus paid for all of that. I receive his forgiveness now in the name of Jesus. And I ask your Holy Spirit to come and fill me and help me to live for you. Amen. If you prayed with us, please write to us, message us and let us know. We'd like to follow up with you. And um, let's pray together now in the house. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you, do indeed love us beyond our understanding. Help us to stay connected to you and in whatever comes at us this week to remember you. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.